like it. And I think there are so many quotes like champions are not made in the gym. Yeah, champions are made basically from something they have deep inside, like some some drive. Yeah, that, that's great. And that's also something we both would recommend our, our customers and companies and partners we work with to also always do things online and virtually yeah. get out of the fucking building. Innovation Rockstars. Innovation Rockstars. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of the Innovation Rockstars podcast. My name is, as always, Chris Mürot, and today I am very happy to welcome Barbara Schandl um, from uh, Mondelez. Um, she is an insights and strategy lead for Snack Future Ventures um, at Mondelez International, if I'm uh, informed correctly. And um, it's really hard to count, Barbara, but I guess you have more than 25 years already of experience in all things related consumer research, uh, marketing, innovation, capability building, country, regional, and globally. Um, and you do have also an expensive experience in emerging markets. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. And you introduced yourself to me as being a different animal. Uh, so let's see um, how we can talk about that. I love that spirit. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And whenever I hear 25 years, I'm like, oh my God, you know, I'm like uh, more than half of my time uh, being in the industry. So making me look old, but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's still a lot of fun. So it's good. <laughs> it is. And as always, uh, we start straight away with a 60 seconds introduction sprint, you know, 60 seconds all for you. It's about your career, your current role. Uh, so, and we have a timer in the background. So for the next 60 seconds, the stage is all yours. Let's go. Mm -hmm. So actually, yeah, different animal. So I would say I'm a, I would call myself a curiosity champion. So consumer insight and innovation professional, uh, yeah, for more than 25 years. I started my career at Nielsen before I joined Kraft Foods in 97 in Vienna. So the journey started really uh, doing local, regional, global roles across uh, various categories, you know, in consumer insights. I built up a really deep expertise in emerging markets. So I worked for more than 10 years uh, for EMEA before I moved uh, to Switzerland 13 years ago. And prior to my, my current position, it stretched around consumer, shopper, marketing, strategy, innovation. And currently I'm the insights and uh, yeah, strategy lead at Snake Futures. Um, uh, we call it a strategic CVC. I will talk about it a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Milka is my favorite brand. So a little bit about <laughs> myself. So I love chocolate. Um, I'm a big sports fan. I do a lot of sport myself, you know, skiing in particular. I love the mountains, uh, but at the same time being love to be at the beach. My values are, I would say, I'm a lifelong learner. I love uh, being inspired and yeah, freedom is another core value of myself. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks. And uh, we do have this little routine where I do ask, you know, three sentence starters. Well, yeah. I give you three sentence starters and I would like to ask you to complete mm -hmm. uh, the sentences. So I start and then you complete. Yeah. Uh, okay. Number one goes like this. Um, one thing that most people do not know about my work mm -hmm. in the snacking industry is how important it is uh, not to look inside the snacking industry, but I would say look outside the snacking industry to see what's changing in consumer behaviors, but also to see how certain trends, you know, complete the bigger picture. Mm, so get out of the typical bubble. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Understood. Okay, great. Number two, uh, a personal mantra or philosophy that guides my approach to innovation is what? Is actually curiosity. Um, I'm not afraid to ask uncomfortable questions, um, as you might have noticed, to get to know me a bit better <laughs> and also intuition, I would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah curiosity and intuition. Okay. Uh, and number three, outside my professional life, something I'm passionate about is... I'm passionate about traveling to new places with uh, mm. my family, with my beloved ones, and in particular also making new experiences. All right. So let's talk about Mandalay's and, and your experiences. Um, and maybe, maybe start with a, with, with a general overview. Uh, could you maybe share a bit about your journey at uh, Mondelez and how, you know, you ended up in Insights and now in Snack Futures. Um, yeah. And maybe you mm -hmm. can add what your team is also doing there and, and how you typically work. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say um, overall, 
how I landed in insights is is probably also describes a little bit of who I am. So I would say, you know, it's probably, again, coming back to curiosity. So I think I have a natural curiosity in people and the world. And that uh, led me uh, to also be very, uh, yeah, actually curious and, and, and also, you know, in my, in my studies. I mean, if I go back also to my, to my school career, but also listening and talking to people has been something I have been probably cultivating for decades. So I think, you know, that's, it's almost like a, a natural fit with what I'm, with what I'm doing, you know, probably that's answering the question of how I landed. And currently, um, I'm doing a really interesting role, um, and I really love to talk about it. So I'm, uh, I'm actually leading insights and strategy at Snack Futures. So it's a strategic, we call it a strategic CVC. So corporate mm -hmm. venture, yeah, capital, um, but it's strategic. So, um, I come to that also. In a, in a second. So it's really not that we are only investing, you know, the money um, into yeah, smaller companies. So making minority in investments, we are also uh, advising them and working with them a lot. Um, and we have also defined uh, our hunting grounds. So we call them basically, you know, being very specific, you know, how we look because you could say, okay, you know, you're going, you know, among, yeah among any startup or among any, you know, new company, but it's not the case. So we have really defined uh, three hunting grounds. You know, it's like uh, from going to disruption in our core business. So mm -hmm. actually anything mm -hmm. what is a bit different to where we already operate in, but also well-being and sustainability is the second hunting ground. And then it's also about new technologies and it's in particular uh, personalization and new experiences. And all that, you know, um, we really hope to make a meaningful contribution, you know, to Mondelez uh, 2030 uh, growth vision, you know. So, and our strategy is really to focus on high potential brands, you know, businesses. They should have a proven concept. So that's also very important for us. Yeah. Um, yeah and they should also be able, we should also be able, you know, together to scale those companies. And up mm -hmm. to date, we have made a a handful of um, investments, yeah. So that's basically, okay. and the team is like uh, like five. Uh, also, you know, talking about my team, you know, we are mm -hmm. five people. It's a very tiny team. Uh, we have a leader actually, Rich, Richie Gray, and then um, we have also three colleagues based in the US. You know, having been very experienced in uh, in the venture part, but also doing financial analysis, and on top, we are also leading a, a program called Colab. Uh, so that's a, a food acceleration program as well. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's very clear in how you connect this to the strategy and the growth ambition uh, of yeah. Mondelez 2030, um, because then, you know, to everybody, it's kind of clear where it has room, what the hunting grounds are, and, you know, to which specific part of the um, growth ambition you actually contribute. Uh, yeah. So that is pretty, pretty clear and I guess powerful in terms of communicating, you know, the why do you exist? How do you help um, the business mm. to actually grow and reach their growth ambitions? Yeah. Can you describe a little bit how your team is working? Do, do you outreach proactively? Do you wait for, you know, somebody else to, um, you know, kind of inbound and then contact you directly? Is it a mix? Um, how do you get to these ventures? So, so I would say it's a, as we are a very small team, you know, it's very important, you know, to build a, a, a really good ecosystem. Um, I would say this is in general, you know, since we started Snack Futures in, um, in 2019, you know, to build a, a really great, uh, ecosystem of external partners. Um, and I would say it's a, it's a combination of, you know, when we talk in particular about the scouting, you know, to put obviously, ourselves out there, right? So it's bringing also the outside world in, in, but being a lot out, which means, you know, we're going a lot to trade shows, you know, we are, but of course we cannot be everywhere, you know, the world oh. is a big world. So it's like, it's, it's almost impossible, but we're also um, starting to work, you know, with partners on really uh, trying uh, to get to the scouting in a more uh, systematic way as well. And obviously we, that's a, that's a hot topic. And probably also a topic of today, you know, using artificial intelligence is helping here a lot, you know, is advancing mm -hmm. here a lot. Yeah. But again, I think still believe you need to be very clear what you're looking for, uh, because also then the scouting efforts, they almost evolve from scouting to attracting those companies, you know. Yeah, 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 they do. And, you know, just last week I've been at one of these conferences 
uh, not not um, at the type of conferences you typically go. Um, at least not what the attendant attendee list is. Uh, we I, I visited a conference that was particularly held for uh, you know software companies, uh, mm. software startups, for example, and the like. And I've talked to a few investors that actually invest in the startup companies, in software companies, um, and they're already making jokes that they count the um, uh, number that the word AI appears in pitch decks of young companies these days. And they have a hit list of, you know, how often is the word AI actually inside the pitch deck? And the more <laughs> often, the less likely they actually contact them because they, you know, just have a gut feeling that they just put AI on top of everything, but it's not really an AI mm. solution. So yes, um, that's a hype, but I'm pretty sure there is good cases for um, any type of artificial intelligence and data analytics to support scouting processes, for example. Yeah, um, That's also something we look uh, into quite heavily. Um, and if you take a look back, uh, in, you know, slightly back at the history, as an insights professional, how have you mm -hmm. seen the market change in the last, you know, five to ten years? What what kind of trends did you see overall? Yeah, I will. Yeah, it's it's a, it's an interesting question. I would say ten years ago for me, you know, it's it was still more around an evolution. You know, maybe mm -hmm. ten, fifteen years ago, I would say now the the research industry is probably the last couple of years, and I would also maybe you see during COVID, but also post COVID is uh, going through more of a transformation, you know, and I see um, three areas, you know, around, uh, I would say, I would call them technological advancements. You know, there is also kind of um, an evolution in uh, consumer behavior. We have better understanding there. And I think there is a, a stronger need than ever for also, you know, actionable insights, you know, I will now, not come back to the technology part of AI because I think, yeah, everybody talks about it and it's accelerating, right? And uh, you can do analysis much faster. I think I will touch base on a, maybe a couple of other points I've been seeing, you know, and I think for me, what's very important is really this area around um, behavior, especially mm -hmm. in connection with uh, innovation. So, you know, really, um, you know, uh, making an effort to understand really the consumer behavior also observation. Um, and I think it's it's also what is not said by a consumer as well. I think that's that's very important. Mm -hmm. I know there is a lot of platform out there. You can ask a lot of questions, but it's still claimed, you know, and it gives you a certain direction, but I would not say that gives you a necessarily a deep insight, you know. Yeah. Again, you need to know how you use it, obviously. Yeah. So but I think there is something for me about, you know, um, you know, maybe you can also See, link it with a bit of eye tracking, right? Semiotics. Yeah, I think that will uh, come much more in the future because, you know, if you want to also be an innovator and you also want to innovate maybe with, within, you know, um, I would also call it um, uh, the base business, you know, in, in a large corporation. Yeah, I think it's all about uh, behavioral understanding. You know, there is yeah. obviously also then we can see a trend around uh, mobile phone research, right? Uh, people are having their mobile phones, you know, there's a lot out there as well. You know, you can almost take service now, you know, on the go. Yeah, there's for sure something around also what I see around uh, less my area of expertise, but advanced analytics. Yeah, so everything around this machine learning, but also predictive, you know, modeling. Yeah, I would also put here in what you see, especially in the food industry. And mm -hmm. I really like to see this that, um, you know, foresights, for example, is something uh, technology companies, but also automotive industries, even the military has been using uh, for a long time, you know, on foresights. I think, you know, some of those industries, you know, were the pioneers. Yeah. Yep. Um, but I also I'm happy to see that also more and more coming up, you know, in the food industry. You know, foresight is not obviously, you know, predicting the future, but, you know, really identifying uh, really good opportunities for a company, you know, where you can play in. And I think this is so essential for me because it's all about, I think, the homework, you know, when you start um, yeah, developing something, something new. The... Technology part now, again, coming back to the AI and uh, this kind of also I call it, I used to talk a lot about real, um, in real life learning, right? Um, so you get insights in real time, yeah, which again is not only AI. We saw it already a couple of years ago, you know, the technology uh, helped us here a lot, yeah. I like that in particular when you talk about, and I think we had a chat, you know, um, one of the first time we met, you know, around democratizing research. So I like that because 
you know, now consumer insights or getting some learnings, it's not only exclusively for a big company, you know, but nowadays, you know, you can really uh, also use, uh, again, platform research, you know, you can do a minimum investment, but you can learn a lot. And it's not just for a, a Mona Lisa, our peer companies, but also for smaller companies like startups. And, and what does democratization mean in this context? Because it's really interesting. Is it democ who, who's the target audience you're uh, you know democratizing for? Is it for the individual employees? Is it maybe even for the startups that they can be found better? Or they, you know who 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 is the who's benefiting from this democratization of research and insight? I think the democrat the the target group who is really benefiting is. First, you know, we, we had the tendency to say, yeah, it's actually for more smaller companies, you know, maybe because maybe they cannot afford, you know, doing a big study, right? Because, I mean, it costs, I mean, the investment is, costs you a lot of money. Yeah, Not yeah. everybody can do a user yeah. attitude study, you know, not everybody. But with the democratization, you know, you can basically, you are able, you know, also to be as a smaller company, more consumer centric, right? So you can... Uh, I mean, you can always ask the question, have you consulted the consumer? But then sometimes you don't maybe have some insights or data. Yeah. So in this True. case, you know, with the democratization and all the tools that are out there and they are really in real life, almost learning, right? So you get sometimes, you know, results within 24 hours Yeah, mm -hmm. is, is something I would say, um, you know, smaller. But I would then also at the same time say it's we also notice bigger companies as well, right? Because now a bigger company can also like like us, we can say, listen, we can we can test and learn with a smaller research vendors as well, which I think is a is a big advantage. You know, I think we can mix and match. We can you know we can do something with technology, but at the same time we can also do something around more behavioral research, because I also believe that there is still something around the human insight. Yeah, for the future, I think it's all yeah. about a balance. Yeah, that. I always tend to say, go where your target group is, right? Go where the consumer is, yeah? And I think there will be still something to put people out somewhere, right? Of course, you can say, yeah, I bring everything with technology inside. I go on the web, you know, I put on maybe even, you know, um, a camera, you know, I see people in a store. I can all do that. But there might be still something around, you know, mm -hmm. a balance around the human connection with the consumer, the observation, But then also, you know, using, of course, the technology, you know, I don't think it will be either or I think it's a, it, it will be a smart combination. Yeah, that, that's, um, that, that could lead us down the path of a discussion, um, for example, between data versus yeah. human intuition. Um, but this yeah. would lead you probably somewhere, somewhere <laughs> completely else. Um, I, I would be very interested to understand also your perspective on how to translate, uh, you know, these insights. Um, and then the research into business outcomes. So sure, you are in the CVC space, so corporate mm -hmm. venture capital. So at the end of the journey, um, in an ideal case, you found a good fit. So you might, you know, invest, take a minority stake, for example, as you mm -hmm. mentioned at the companies or the startup, and for example, solve a technology gap or fill, fill a technology gap or capacity gap or mm -hmm. whatever and help Mondelez grow. Are you also helping other units at Mondelez and, you know, share your research and insights um, that you, for example, produce with them so that they can take action except for, for example, corporate venturing um, and investing into those companies? Or is, is that not your primary target audience, uh, secondary target audience in Mondelez? So I would say it's very important, you know, like me, and I think I want to also act as a role model, you know, to bring back mm. the learnings, you know, from the last couple of years, you know, because also Snake Futures, the journey started also slightly different, right? I think I told mm. you. So I think we learned a lot. We, we, we tested a lot. We, we, we basically, we also made probably a couple of mistakes, you know, some things didn't go that well, but I think, you know, you don't learn, otherwise you probably don't learn, right? So we had the flexibility and the ability. And I think it's super important, you know, I always try to stay connected to, um, you know, I'm based here um, in Switzerland, Zurich, you know, I'm, I'm very close also with the European team, but also with the Innovation Excellence team to bring back those learnings, right? So to stay connected um, and, and share, you know, also what we learn from, a, I would say, Yeah, CVC, a small CVC as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. how do we learn? You know, what partners do we take on board? You know, what are things we are seeing? What it's maybe worth to solve for? Because I think, you know, um, this team is so different also because 
we operate a lot in the outside world, right? And I'm so long in the company and until, you know, I joined Snake Futures, it was all about this micro, it was almost like a little microcosmos, you know? <laughs> it was all, almost around, okay, you're researching that, right? You're, you're, you're very much close in, yeah? And I think it's very important, you know, um, to basically share, you know, our, our, uh, the things we are, we are doing because I think it can also help the wider Mondelez organization mm -hmm. Um, on their innovation journey, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think so. And there are very good cases to be made why, you know, human intuition and data-driven approaches um, could go well hand in hand. I mean, yeah. sure, a pure data-driven approach, for example, just collecting the data and then send this to other teams at Mondelez for the innovation efforts is interesting and certainly has its place. Um, but of course, if, if, you know, you are about to democratize research and insights, um, also into the industry and there might be a point where everybody just has the same data and then everybody would operate on the same, uh, you know, insights from that data ultimately. So where is the new, where's the creativity? Mm -hmm. So of course you need human intuition and maybe even human intellect yeah. um, uh, to help um, and then yeah. fuel innovation processes. That's, that's of course understood. And I think that will also come a bit, you know, I think we saw now a bit of a shift in the insights industry where also a lot of technology companies yeah. came in, right? And that's totally fine, you know, uh, to be a technology, so because I was asking some company, do you see yourself as a technology company or an insights company? And they said, ah, oh, mm, okay, you know, maybe more technology company. And I think that's fine until, you know, then you have also a team, right? They can help you to translate, you know, certain outputs into these actionable insights. I think you still need, um, you know, insights uh, professionals, you know, they're able, you know, to join certain dots, right, to see the bigger picture. Yeah. They say, okay, you know what, we found that here, you know, and it's not maybe only from that particular one study, but just, you know, uh, because we need to also keep in mind that in, in large, you know, in large corporates, you know, the, the teams are getting smaller, right? So it's almost, again, building an extended arm. You, you know, I need a sparring partner. I need a, I need a good partner, a good agency to work with me. But not just to execute, right? To launch, a, like to launch yeah. something I could do basically myself, yeah. But really, I also have you know very good uh, conversations, yeah. And I think that is that is something I see also in the last 12, 18 months coming back. You know that that agencies are really mm -hmm. investing mm -hmm. in that. Yeah. Um, can, can you maybe share just an example of a story of where this you know the human skill connecting the dots, having people connecting the dots. Um, actually was particularly valuable. Any story you can share? Obviously a non-confidential one. Yeah, I, I, I believe, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I thought, like, I'm thinking about that actually a lot. You know, I think, you know, yeah. I, did, I did it a lot in my, you know, instance, and I'm always trying to do it, you know, not just taking, you know, when I do, for example, a work, right, and you're doing a study mm. or you're launching something, you're, you're, you're starting from a broader point of view, right? So you first True. see, okay, what has been done? What do we know? You know, again, coming back to the uncomfortable uh, questions, asking part, you know, is there something else we can do? Is there something else actually we can, um, we can learn? And I think trying to sort of then pinpoint that to a current study, you know, if that makes sense. I, mean, I know it sounds maybe a bit strange. So trying to do that every time, you know, it's almost like it's, it's less of a, a what, but really cultivating a certain way of working and mindset. Yeah. I think that that is something I tried to establish for myself in the last couple of years. I'm not saying I did it all the time because, you know, of course, when I was a young researcher, you got a research request and you were executing right? it was always seen as more of a, you know, maybe in my, in the first years of my career, it was more like seen as a support function. But yeah. now, you know, moving to my current role and here I wanted to give uh, an example is like, it's like less than joining the dots, but I think more joining the people, you know, and the more you join the people, you know, the more we can also be successful in the food ecosystem. So, for example, with big companies, um, startup companies, but also, for example, universities as well. So for me, this collaboration part is almost, you know, the innovation we need, you know, mm -hmm. in the to change the food ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. And um, I, I, I would also like to tap into some of your lessons learned um, and maybe also understand how, you know, the process looks like just on a very high level um, to, to share with others that might be interested. 
uh, in, in learning how, you know, one of the leaders, Mondelez is a clear leader mm -hmm. uh, in this, um, you know, does that. But before uh, we move to the lessons learned, I would like to play, uh, play a quick game. Uh, the game is called Rapid Fire Round. It's a super simple game. Um, okay. And uh, it works basically like that. Again, three, I do have three questions. Um, I would ask the questions and the idea is that you answer fast. So speed is key. The first mm -hmm. thing that comes to your mind, just shoot. Um, because this typically is, is, is quite uh, interesting. Okay, are you up for the game? Mm -hmm. yes. Super simple. Okay, cool. Number one. Um, okay, I have to ask the question. What is your go-to snack when you are working late? Chocolate. Chocolate. Yeah. Milka? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you said that before. Yeah. Milka, but, but yeah, yeah. I have, a, I have a, I'm really a chocolate connoisseur, so I'm, I, I love chocolate. So, yeah. Got it. Okay. And now, if you could have dinner with any person, uh, be it dead or alive, who would it be and why? It's um, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Michael Jordan. I, I mean, I, I used to, I'm not tall, but I used to be basketball for a long time mm. and I trained kids. So, um, so Michael Jordan was always a kind of a role model. And I read something about him that he played every game like it was his last game mm. because he always thought there's maybe somebody in the audience who has not has actually has not seen him playing. Uh, and I really mm. like it. And I think there's so many quotes, like when he says, you know, um, champions are not made in the gym. Yeah, champions are made basically from something they have deep inside, like a, like a steamer, like some, some drive. And I really like that. I think I, I, I admire, I, I admire actually the sport, but also I admire him as a person. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's great. And that's also something we, you know, um, both would recommend, you know, a, a, you know, our, our customers and companies and partners we work with, but also our own people is, and sorry for the word, get out of the fucking building. Particularly if you are now, you know, you know, with all the post COVID stuff, you also always do things online and virtually yeah. um, by default. Many companies have basically uh, just canceled any travel budgets. So mm. th that's a very bad thing to do um, because you just um, decrease, you know, what's called your success surface yeah. area. You're exposing okay. yourself to less opportunities, less people, less opportunities in the network. So that's a very bad thing to do. But yeah, yeah get out of the fucking building. So that's kind of the same thing. Leaders are not being made or champions are not being made in the gym. Nice. Michael Jordan, a legend. And then number three, if you were not working in the snack industry, what would you be doing instead? I would do something where I bring out the best in people. Um, yeah, uh, actually, uh, and and really support uh, support people and also can act as a source of inspiration. And that leaves a room for imagination. You know, you can say, uh, yeah, I'm a teacher. I mean, I'm I'm a coach myself. Also, I'm an ACC. But yeah, yeah. something where I can can bring out. I think I have the ability to bring out the best in people. I heard that quite often, but also acting mm -hmm. like a source, you know, bringing people on board, you know, like doing, doing something. People are really important to me. Yeah. Yeah. Understood. Well, that's nice. Uh, I was just about to ask coach, but yeah, you kind of mentioned yeah. it. So yeah. I'm a that, coach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to business, back to Monalise, when it comes to business, um, Let's talk about, you know, some of the nitty gritty stuff. So mm -hmm. what makes Mondelez a, you know, a partner of choice for emerging brands and then startups, for example, because I mean, you have a pretty strong brand. Mm -hmm. I guess you have a fantastic position uh, globally, um, but there's competition, obviously. So, you know, what, what, what do you do differently than others in, in working with or investing in uh, startups and early stage companies? Um, I would say... It's probably, again, it's probably the human aspect. It's interesting, you know, that you mm -hmm. mentioned that before. Um, and again, coming back that we are really strategic, you know, we, and we want a call to be a strategic CVC. So it's for us not about only the, you know, the investment, the minority investment we are doing, but also we want to listen, respond and connect with those companies. So that's very important. And it's also not only what we put into it, but also what we get back. So it should be a, a two-way street, you know, and... Yep. We have been trying, you know, to do that. I mean, starting doing that with our um, accelerator, with Colab a couple of years ago, you know, where, you know, companies in the US applied, you know, and really creating a little bit, uh, creating a really true partnership, you know, with mm -hmm. those companies going through the Colab program. 
But now, you know, as we made a couple of investments, you know, and we call them our portfolio companies, we're really trying to build strong relationships. You know, it, it, it's it's um, it's it's almost you know I'm in contact with some of those companies on a on a daily basis. You know, so it's like you know having a conversation. Um, it's like asking you know about okay, what is it actually? What, what from a consumer angle, you know, what is most urgent for for to solve? You know. It's about, you know, understanding maybe their target consumer. So it's it's a really um, great, um, I would say, collaboration as well. So it's not just, okay, yeah, here's the money and then we go off, you know, and we say, basically we say goodbye, yeah, and, and, and we leave it and, and we, we, we hope, you know, then uh, in terms of, you know, the, 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 path, the path also to, to scale something. Yeah. But I think, you know, we are really uh, trying to create an atmosphere where it's, uh, yeah, where we can actually learn from the companies, but we it's we give actually the company as well. Because at the end, you know, it's also, you know, I have to say in the last six months, I have learned, I have learned a lot. You know, I I, I thought, okay, you know, I work here at Mondelez, you know, for so many years and I, I know so many things. But then, you know, again, to your point, getting outside of the building, you know, and working with a company, uh, yeah, which just started or started a couple of years ago, is super fascinating because I mean the questions they have, you know, the things they need to think of, you know, is 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 so different, yeah. And if if you if you had to break it down, super simple, um, what would be the the one thing that you look for when uh, considering investing in you know a startup or early stage companies? Uh, I mean, there is multiple things, of course. You know, technology fit the company yeah, and so on. But yeah. if you had to break it down to one thing, maybe the most crucial one, what could that be possibly? I I would say it's probably then also around the investment thesis. Mm -hmm. If I can mm -hmm. bring that in, you know, so it's not a it's not probably a company who's super super small in terms of just started right, not yet in a way profit like like in a very early stage. So we're talking maybe yeah. half a million. Like it has yeah. to be. A couple of million. So again, you know, a bit of a proven, um, kind of a little bit of a proven concept, you know, among a target audience. So where we also feel there is a potential to scale up. And at the same time, you know, you can ask also yourself the question, again, it goes back, you know, a certain pain point to solve, you know, for the consumer, but also something we don't have maybe in Mondelez to bring in as an expertise, you know. So... There's a mutual benefit. Mm. Yeah, and that, that's, that's I guess, maybe the best spot um, to look at. I'm asking because I had a similar conversation um, just a few weeks ago uh, with uh, somebody who's into uh, corporate um, uh, venturing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this um, venture clienting uh, discussion we're, we're having for quite some time now. Also an interesting, you know, um, methodology in a way. And I, you know, recently um, in that conversation, um, he said to me that the willingness to mm. cooperate was very important um, in the past, but they, they've actually switched to, they, they slightly switched to, they said the most important thing to them when working with a small company is a commitment mm. to cooperate. What does that mean aside from the product and the like is that, you know, if, if they would call them middle of the night and say, hey, guy, you know, guys and girls, you need to be in tomorrow morning because we have an important meeting, fly into whatever, London, yeah. Switzerland, US, uh, we really need you on site. Would this or that person who's heading the startup, who's running the operations of the startup, say yes or say, you know, yeah, yes, no, I, you know, um, and find some excuses why this is not possible. So a true mm. commitment. Yeah. And they actually do this. They do commitment tests. They oh, literally, wow. you know, call them at, uh, I don't know, 5, 40, 45 or 6.30 in the evening, telling them some story, what they need the next day, or can we meet next day or whatever, just to test commitment, if they're really into the partnership or not. And they'd say, this is often revealing a lot. Um, so it's more on the human side or on the, on the operation yeah. side of business. Um, but I found this also very interesting. Obviously, if it doesn't solve any problem and there is no product market fit or customer product fit or whatsoever, then it doesn't make any sense. I, I totally agree uh, with you. But I found the commitment to cooperate quite interesting. Yeah, but I like, I like that part on the commitment. Yeah. Uh, I also we hear more and more. It's also interesting, and I'm not sure if that's a trend because I have not been in this yeah, let's say venture, you know, environment that long, yeah. right? So I've just started uh, to dive a little bit in, you know, and have meetings, you know, with external partners. But, you know, there's also interesting that 
all, like we hear founders sometimes saying, yes, you know, I'm raising maybe money for my next round, you know, and maybe they have uh, also somebody at hand who can uh, do the financial investment. So it's a financial investor, right? But there's nothing more, right? It's a financial investment. But a lot of founders, they look actually also a bit for strategic investment as well, exactly for yeah. also this kind of yeah. uh, a bit of mentoring, working together, because obviously, you know, we as a company, you know, we can also open, you know, up doors, you know, to our internal network at Mondelez. So for example, if there is a supply mm -hmm. chain topic and if there is another topic, it's not, it's not always, you know, obviously a marketing insights topic, but there are so many things about capacity, you know, and the founders are really interested in that because that, that uh, actually taps into great uh, resources. Yeah. So a lot of founders, they are now also uh, talking about about that as well. But I like it from the other way about the commitment part. I really like that. I will I will I will take that on board. That's a that's a great <laughs> one. Yeah. yeah. I guess it's quite interesting because because it, it tells so much about yeah. the 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 um, yeah. to be business partner um, mm -hmm. you might have. Um, and Barbara, what is maybe a controversial opinion that you hold about the future of the entire snack industry? I'm sure there is one. Yeah, there is actually one. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and now when I say it, people will laugh because they say, oh God, she says it again, you know, mm. because I said it already probably. I mean, when I talk, because, you know, I like, I like speaking the truth to a certain extent. I also don't, don't like, you know, sometimes people say they wish they, they see actually a picture of how consumers should behave, but in fact, they're not behaving like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, can give another example. Not a, not everything we see, you know, is 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 happen. It will happen again. I'm only talking about the snacks industry. You know, I'm only talking sure. about sure. a very tiny, you know, something thing because you see certain things and it's like, oh my god, this is going to be, and then it never, it never, you yeah. never see it again. You know what I mean? It's like it's a little bit like that. So coming back to the contro controversial point, yeah. My controversial point is. Yes, there is well-being, you know, and people around the globe, you know, I think everywhere you go, they want to do better, right? They say, yes, mm -hmm. of course, I want to go to the gym. I want to eat better. I want, uh, of course, I will not, I will reduce my smoking. I, uh, so consumers have this intent. They have a positive intent, yeah? yeah. yeah. But sometimes the intent from, is actually not really the reality, so when you ask them again, it goes back to claim to mm -hmm. like when you ask them they say, you know, I, I saw a, a study in the US where I think, you know, the top two box of, uh, of uh, US consumer said they, they think they live extremely healthy, extremely too healthy. Yeah. Like a top box of a 90%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, claimed, you know, I want to do a better life, but it's not really, you know, matching the reality, you know? So the controversial the controversial, you know, belief I, I hold is that, yes, there is change. Absolutely. You know, the change is happening. It's very small, but significant. Yeah. It's baby steps. And we mm -hmm. see it over the last, let's say, 10, 15 years. Right. I mean, well-being trend is around for a long, long, long time. Yeah. yeah. I still do believe that there is also a current consumer reality where people just want if you talk about snacking right and snacking uh, let's say like in like connecting it with food that the snack has to taste good right otherwise there will not potentially be a repurchase rate until it's a, a niche target group yeah because there needs to be a consumer cohort at the beginning they say listen i adopt that and i'm much better off with the product without than without you you know but there needs to be something in there yeah so I, I believe, you know, again, it's about food. Snack has to taste good. It doesn't say that they cannot be healthy at the same time. We are getting yeah. there. We see huge improvement in the last, I would say, one, two, three, four years. Also at the trade shows we went, you know, you see a lot of great products out there. You, you can taste a lot of great things, yeah. But then, you know, you, know, you need to also be um, actually realistic to say, that um, if you live within a, f a family, you know, that some consumers can also not afford, you know, they want to live healthier, but it's not always that they can maybe buy 
certain products because even though they, they, they would, they say, yeah, yeah, of course I would buy those products, but then the reality is they cannot afford them. So I think there is sometimes um, a bit of a, 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 it's a romance, you know, some people will hate, hate me for that saying, yeah, but it's a nice romance, you know, there, it, we're getting there, you know, and, and you see changes. Yeah, you see, We can also talk about sustainability. Yes, you see those changes. You also see those evolving consumer groups. Yeah, But if you talk about a, a bigger, a bigger angle, you know, yeah. again, it's, it's, uh, we need to go and solve for problems consumers and people are really having. Yeah. I think I found this. I think this conversation is super interesting because what what I found interesting about this and also the human intellect is that you know snacking, especially sweets, the 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 good tasting stuff, sometimes the unhealthy stuff, is there to reward oneself, right? They say you know treat yourself, um, give yourself a treat, um, so it's positive. But actually, everybody knows that eating too much sugar is not healthy, right? Everybody just knows yeah. that. So it's interesting why we, you know, associate reward with unhealthy behavior. So because for 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 yeah. health, for the actual body health, it's not really a reward. It's it's the opposite. But the human intellect, the human mind says, "Hmm, I'm now rewarding myself with that. Why not rewarding yourself with something that's actually healthy um, mm. and find this rewarding?" If you tell people, you know, I don't know, go in the forest for a walk. They mm. don't find, many don't find this rewarding. Yeah. Um, and they say, I want to have a good treat. Um, I want to reward myself for the hard work. Let's eat, uh, mm. I don't know, chips or snacks or chocolate, whatever. So it's, it's interesting that you combine reward with actually unhealthy behavior. Um, and I agree to you that this is slowly but steadily changing um, yeah. over time. And you don't see this in consumer behavior, um, not in the data particularly. Uh, yeah. But the first time, that's where you need sensing. You need to talk to the people. You need to understand exactly. what do they Absolutely. want. Longer health, yeah. longer health, you know, longer lifespan, longer healthy lifespan mm. in the case. Um, but at the same time, you see, for example, they're buying lots of snacks and chips and, and chocolate all the time. So where's the connection between their desire to have a longer health, but at the same time, you know, eating sugar. So that's quite an interesting thing yeah. about the human intellect. There uh, is a bit of a paradox here, you know, and, and again, we're mm. getting getting there and it's it's really yeah. it's changing and 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 we should have a culture of saying yes yes and it's you know um because we never know what's going to blow up right at the end True. you know we, we we as humans think we know so well but we we don't yeah so uh we always have to be anticipative but i think that's that's a controversial yeah. belief i'm yeah. i'm holding us <laughs> wonderful wonderful I could go, I mean, we could probably go on one or two hours, um, yes. but I think we, we should take it to a close um, and uh, maybe we do a follow up on this because I really, I really like the, the, the viewpoints uh, that you bring to the table. But if you were to summarize, you know, the conversation and also, you know, give some, 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 mm. some recommendations, some actionable recommendations to uh, the listeners, what would your advice be to the listeners out there that are also maybe tapping into CVC or at least are in that space, in that realm of cooperating with smaller companies, mm -hmm. um, startups and the like? So I have actually, there's something around for me asking questions is always important. It doesn't matter which field you work, you know, it's like um, mm. staying curious, but for me, an advice would be don't be afraid to ask the unf uncomfortable questions, you know, from the beginning, even though you might not be the most popular person, but, but it's, it's important, you know, somebody has to do it, you know? Yeah. So I think that's one advice I have, you know, usually I always tended to do that, you know, coming more from the insights, mm. the insights angle, but I think that's, that's, that's important, you know, for me, so asking questions. Then for me, there's one around the, I would say, mindset also, you know, it's, it's less about the what it's really for me about the mindset, keeping a, a stubborn, but at the same time, flexible mindset. When you have a belief, you have to believe, but at the same time, keep always a certain flexibility. Mm. So to your point, get out, get out of the building, you know, so it's like at the same time when he holds something and you're strongly convinced, but then... Again, it's a paradox. It's a contradiction in itself, but I think it's important. Yeah. And then what I personally like is, you know, a culture of saying yes. 
Yeah. Also, if sometimes some ideas, you know, from some people, especially when you get into, you know, the founder world or you get into new stuff, right? And you, you see things you haven't seen before, develop a culture of saying yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so things like they wouldn't be done, they could get done. A culture of one to one, a culture of why not? Yeah. Because again, as I said before, we think as human beings, we know, but we don't know what's going to blow up. Yeah. So I think, I think that's for me, uh, again, more creating a positive environment rather than, you know, being me being now more than 25 years in the industry and they say, oh, I've seen it all, you know, and, uh, but why is it like this? Uh, no, but we have done it already. Oh, we have done it eight times. No, it will not work. You know what I mean? I think flip it and you might get surprised, you know? Um, and I think that's, and when you come back to the question in particular around working other CVC or venture part, mm. what I have noticed it, take the consumer on board. It doesn't hurt. You know, you can ask the question, have you consulted the consumer? You know, and also when you work for private equity or venture, you know, and I know they do product market fit, they do a lot of financial analysis. Yeah. But sure. my feeling is there is a huge room for improvement in that area to get more down the consumer route, you know, get more down the consumer path because just using technology or AI doesn't make you consumer centric, you know, because no. that's a whole new other story topic uh, we can uh, episode we can talk about because just using that is like is is not is not necessarily connecting you with consumer centricity. But so, but I believe, you know, now with my background getting into this area, I think it will be kind of refreshing for some people because um, I have no clue. I have no clue about certain things, but that's fine. I will learn. Um, and sometimes it's also, you know, we can apply the importance of maybe being clueless as well. But at the same time, I have yeah. a lot of experience and insights, right? And I can sort of mix and match it and I can test and learn. And I think, let's see um, what comes out. <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. And um, uh, th th thanks for that advice. Um, again, talking about artificial intelligence would probably leave us with um, a whole nother, uh, you know, series oh. of episodes. Um, so I, I, I fully agree. And I, personally, I, I can hardly remember any conversation I had or any even company on the world that doesn't aspire to be customer centric, but it's in the details. Of course, we know yeah. that we all do this for customers or for the greater good, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. That, that's of course for sure. But as you say, um, correctly, it's in the details. I mean, sure. Everybody's customer centric. But what does this mean for your business? How do you implement that? Mm -hmm. How do you take action? Uh, so, so I agree. It's easy to say, but you know how to actually do that. Um, so, thanks for this insight. And uh, we have a tradition at the Innovation Rockstars podcast of asking our guests for their Innovation Rockstar um, mm -hmm. moment. So, Barbara, I need to hear from you also. Um, if you look back on the professional career, tell me about your Innovation Rockstar moment. Um, so if we talk about innovation that basically, you know, adds a, a certain change. So if you define it like that, I would say my biggest moment was when I was in marketing a long, long time ago and I launched Tassimo, you know, the coffee mm -hmm. machine in Austria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I see this as an innovation rockstar moment is that it's really building on a older, you know, coffee machines at this time were building on a new consumer behavior and contributed to a change in how people drink coffee. And I really love that. You know, I, I mention it quite often, you know, um, because for me, that was a, for me, that was a big moment because also it was, uh, um, in internally we had a, then later we had also a venture team around, around Tassimo, which I joined, you know, when I moved uh, to Switzerland. So that's, that's actually the biggest, probably innovation star moment. Yeah. Wonderful. That's that's a great uh, rockstar moment. And uh, with that rockstar moment, we are closing. Uh, we're coming to an end for this episode. Again, Barbara, thanks so much. Um, it's, it has been a real pleasure uh, to have you on this episode. It was a pleasure. Thanks for being my yeah, guest. For me as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Talk soon. And to everybody listening or watching, um, say bye to Barbara. And if you enjoyed this episode, then simply leave us a comment um, or just drop an email at info at innovationrockstars.show. That's it. Thanks for listening. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.
That was innovation rock star Barbara Shandel. Snack Futures Mondelez Insights and Strategy Lead with a deep dive into market trends and startup partnerships in the snack industry. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Don't hesitate to reach out to us at info at innovationrockstars.show with your feedback, comments, or questions. And if you're hungry for more inspiring innovation stories, be sure to check out our website at www.innovationrockstars.show or browse through our Innovation Rockstars channel on all major podcast platforms.